Hello, everyone. Before I start, a show of hands, how many people of you regularly think about queuing? That's pretty good, because otherwise it would have been this situation. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, HTTP and um, how to add the capability of queuing packets in uh, the HTTP forwarding path. And I already got a, a question um, before this talk, uh, which I'm actually going to address as the first thing. Why? Why would we do this? Why does HTTP need to queue packets? So um, I'm going to go come back to in more detail how the HTTP forwarding path works. But this is sort of a, a, a bit of a, a contrived example. We set up a, an experiment where you redirect from 100 gigabits into 10 gigabits using on the, um, the green line, a, the regular Linux path. And uh, the dotted line is, is HTTP forwarding. And as you can see, a single TCP flow cannot fill uh, the pipe here at all because there's no buffers. Like a basically forwarding with HTTP um, is today kind of similar to a very shallow buffered switch where you have no way to store packets. You just send out, and this works as long as ingress and egress has the same speed and you can keep up. But as soon as uh, you have a rate transition or anything other than that, you start dropping packets, and this does not work very well for TCP. Um, also, there are some other use cases where we can what where we can get new things when we can queue packets. So anything compared um, related to packet scheduling policies like fast queuing, QoS, uh, reordering packets of any kind uh, requires the ability to queue packets somehow. Bandwidth shaping is another thing where if you have a um, either a very small box like a home router that you probably have at home, everyone, and probably runs Linux. And you probably can't keep up with the internet speed these days because those go up. So we can accelerate forwarding on the edge with XTP. Or you can have a big box in a data center that shapes a 1,000 customers and an ISP, and you want to do policy shaping here. Um, you can also do things like network uh, emulation, reordering, delaying packets, all the stuff that you just do in the regular stack, right? Um, but accelerated with XTP. And then there's also like a, the, the last one is a bit more speculative. Uh, you can do custom buffering schemes where, say, um, you have a CNI plugin uh, like Cilium and you want to support something where you spin up containers uh, when a packet comes into a particular service with a buffering scheme in XDP. You can do this there and then just hold on to the packet a little while, wait for the container to come up and send them in. Um, so, but that sort of, um, those kind of use cases I'm sure will appear once we, once we add this. At least I'm hoping so. So, just to, uh, to review in detail, how does the HTTP redirect path actually work? We start up here in the, um, in the top left corner where uh, a driver, in the driver, packet comes in, those are the solid lines, goes into the HTTP program. HTTP program uses the BPF redirect map helper here. Um, which all this really does is it populates this uh, BPF redirect info struct, which is a per CPU um, struct, and then it just returns, and it returns uh, HTTP redirect if, if this worked. And then once the HTTP program has exited, um, the driver will call HTTP do redirect, which does the actual work of redirecting the packet. And then for the forwarding case, like, XTP to redirect is, is really a demoxer on all the different types of redirect you can do, which is pretty neat because then we can add new types of redirects without changing anything in the driver. Um, and devmap in queue is the thing it does when we are forwarding packets. So what devmap in queue does, it actually just buffers the packet a little bit, it puts it into a bulk queue that can hold up to 16 packets. So this is the very shallow buffered thing. And this thing, like the gray area here, is, the, is then repeated for the whole nappy loop. So we, we actually just put it on a bulk queue, and we, um, and we wait down here until the driver is done with the loop, and then it does flush. And as soon as we do flush, we go into the uh, XMIT part of the uh, dev map um, thing, and that will just call NDO XTP XMIT and put the packets on the wire. And as you can see on the outer uh, dotted line here, this all happens inside a single nappy cycle in a single soft IQ. So it's all pushed through. And uh, if at any point during this time, for example, if the uh, TX side buffers are full, if we can't transmit the packet, it just gets dropped. 
Uh, and this is also like, there's a trace point where you can see package string dropped, but one of the pitfalls of XTP redirect is that you get some really nice numbers for how many times you can do this bit, but once you actually get down to transmitting the package, they're not going anywhere and you don't um, necessarily realize this unless you look at those trace points. Contrast this with uh, the um, net networking stack regular forwarding flow. Uh, and similar to uh, Jakob's talk later, this contains simplifications, omissions, and lies. But uh, very simply, the driver will build an FKB. It will go up the stack. We're just hand waving away all the protocol handling. We're just forwarding here, so it gets routed. And then it goes down to DefQ XMIT, which enqueues it into a, a QDIFT. And then the package just goes here and, and sits in the QDIFT for a little while. And then it does an IF schedule. Um, through the QDISH start bit, and that actually raises a soft IQ. The QDISH watchdog also does the same thing, uh, which can be timer-based for packet shaping. And then a whole new TX action over here in the TX of the IQ starts, and that will put the packets back out of the QDISH and push them into the driver, similar to what we had with, um, with HTTP. So in, able to be, in order to be able to queue packets uh, in HTTP, we sort of need to replicate this bit here on the right to have somewhere to store the packets and to somewhere, somehow, um, a way to push them out of the interface. So these are the ingredients we need. Somewhere to store the packets, a way to schedule DQ and transmission. And um, let's look at these two separately. So uh, if we look at the prior art, um, we have, in my account, uh, 38 different files in NetShed. Uh, representing different QDISCs. So how many different data structures do these different QDISCs actually use? Well, there's a hint if we look at the uh, start of the SK buff, which is where um, the pointer is used to uh, store the packets inside of certain data structure. And like this is next and previous pointers for a linked list. This is irrelevant. This is an RB node for an RB tree. And these are also linked lists. So all of these really fundamentally only use two different data structures, an RB tree for uh, a sorted list or a simple, uh, simple linked list for just a, a FIFO buffer. Um, and a linked list, so an, an, an RB tree or a, a priority queue can also be used as a FIFO. So we can actually narrow this down to we just need a single data structure, some kind of priority queue to store packets in. Um, and then we can use that for anything. And obviously for BPF, uh, the data structure is a map. So my proposal um, for what we need for XTP to just store packets is some kind of priority queue um, so that we can also use it as a, as a FIFO. We only need this one type. It's only a matter of performance uh, and we can try to optimize that for, so that if you just use it, of, use it as a FIFO, you get reasonable performance anyway. And we want to reuse the uh, BPF redirect map um, functionality. As I showed on the previous slide, this allows us to demarks without changing anything in the driver. So if we just say, OK, we have a, a Q type map, and we already have a parameter to the BPF redirect map, which is used uh, to specify the map index. So this can just be used to store the priority. And then we have a mechanism where an, a BPF program can quite straightforwardly just uh, queue a packet onto a map. And then to get the packets back out, um, my proposal here is to have a, a new map helper that dechews the packets and which will return a pointer to BTFID, which is a reference to the struct XDPMD, which is the context object for XDP. So that means that when we pull the packets back out, we can use BTF um, to look at the packet con uh, content and we can get direct packet access just like the regular BPF program. There's some example code on a later slide on how this actually looks in a very simple case, but this is sort of the, uh, the map uh, structure that um, I've implemented to deal with this. So what's the overhead of doing this in terms of redirecting? I'm doing um, nanoseconds per packet instead of um, um, packets per second, because that sort of looks more directly at the overhead. And this here, 36 nanoseconds, is the, um, the minimum delay for just a FIFO queue that's very dumb, does nothing, it just puts the packets in and pulls them back out again. 
straight, um, straight after. This is the RB3 based. I'll come back to what the PIFO is. But so the overhead from, the, uh, from just FIFO is uh, basically the overhead of instead of just pushing through the packets immediately, we put them on a buffer, we spin up a, um, a separate soft IQ thread to push them back out. I'll come back to how we do that. Um, and most of this, um, as far as, as perf uh, is concerned, is actually the cache misses because we no longer, um, it's a different packet. So it's gone out of cache by the time we come back to Detroit, as far as I could tell from perf. And so uh, the RB tree overhead here is um, because RB tree does this. You're not supposed to be able to read it. It's just um, to point out that there's a lot of, of tree, like the RB tree implementation is, um, is highly optimized, but it does do a lot of tree rebalancing. It doesn't run all this code every time you remove something from the RB tree, but it does it enough that this has a significant overhead, which for HTTP um, turns into, it basically doubles the overhead of the queuing operation just from um, using the arbitrary. So we had this thing in the middle that was called a PIFO queue, which um, is a data structure that actually comes from the literature. So I'll, I'll, I'll do a slight detour and talk a little bit about PIFO queues. Um, so a PIFO queue is this push in first out data structure, which appeared in the literature um, five years ago. And it's actually targeted at, um, Silicon implementation. So this is a data structure that's implementable in hardware. It's a limited priority queue where you can push in at any time, hence the name, but you can only dequeue from the head. And that's lent itself well, as it turns out, to be implemented in Silicon. Now, we're not doing Silicon, we're doing software. So we don't really need to limit ourselves to the PIFO data structure. Like we can do arbitrary dequeue at an, another position if we want. But the nice thing that appeared when we were looking at this is that there's an optimized algorithm in software in a, in a different paper um, called Eiffel, which uh, does this bitmap-based index into a list of buckets. So uh, you have different queues, which is your priority. And at each priority, uh, you just have a FIFO of packets. So if you are in queue multiple packets with the same priority, you just put them into a FIFO. And then you have this uh, hierarchical bitmap where on this figure, it's only two bits, but these will be words. So you have 64 bits at each level. And then you, if, if this bit is set, that means the next level has a packet in it and you go through all the way. And then you have a, a very efficient index into um, where is a packet in queue. So if you have to find the lowest priority packet, um, you can do that really efficiently with just a few find first set um, bits. And of course, this is just an array of queues. So um, if you want to do out of order, find something at a, a like DQ at a particular priority, you just index into the array. Now, the, the drawback of this is that it's fixed. Um, so like the RB data structure, you can put any priority in there and it just sorts them basically. Whereas this, you have to ahead of time decide how many buckets do you have. And these are only the only priority levels that you can do. Um, that is, for some applications, that's totally fine. If you just want to do a priority queue with fixed priorities, you just create this and do it. But if you want to do things like calendar queues, where you are pacing out packets and doing time-based things, then this becomes a bit of a problem, where, because you want to actually um, advance the, um, the priorities as you use them up, as time passes, right? And so they do have a solution for this, where you create behind the scenes, you create two different sets of the same um, number of queues, and then you rotate them. So here we are sort of in the middle where there's packets in the top priorities uh, of the primary and um, the bottom priorities of the second. So as you advance the window of priorities you're using, you will sort of switch from the primary to the secondary. And then at some point you will come all the way over here where this one gets completely empty and then you rotate them. And then you have the second, um, like you, you do the whole thing over again once you pass through the second. So this requires you to know ahead of time 
um, roughly what's the window of priority values that you're going to do. But as long as you just keep advancing, for example, when you are using time-based priorities to do something like EDT or, or what ShadowQ is doing, you can use this data structure and you still get the efficient lookup for finding the next uh, bit in it. So that was the, um, the thing here in the middle. And you can see this performs uh, significantly better than the arbitrary in terms of overhead. And I think this added uh, 22 nanoseconds is not actually so much the, uh, the bit operations. It's more about, again, the uh, bitmap itself being cowled in cache. So you get cache meshes when you put it in. Um, but it's about half the overhead of uh, the arbitrary based one. So the question then, in terms of the data structure, is is this API limit acceptable? Um, it seems like uh, the performance benefit is worth actually using this, this um, optimized data structure. But we can discuss that if anyone has any ideas for, for other data structures, um, we can discuss that as well. And then as, as far as the API is concerned, what we're proposing here is the re reuse BPF redirect maps. We don't have to change the drivers and then have a separate helper to push the packets back out. Which brings us to the other ingredient that we need. How are we actually going to schedule and dequeue these packets? Now we have packets in a map. Uh, they're sitting there and they'll stay around forever until we um, clear the map, which is obviously not so useful. So. What could we do instead? We want a TX hook. And we had a, um, the first attempt, which has submitted as an RFC back in July, is to add a new program type, uh, which can be attached to an interface like an XDP program. And then uh, the stack will call this program, ask, do you have a packet for me? This program then goes and looks in its Python map and says, yes, I have this packet. And it just returns the packet as the result of the BPF program execution. And then the stack will do NDO, XDP, XMIT, and transmit and batch up packets the same way as, uh, as XDP is doing on, on RX. So if we go back to the, um, to the diagram of the networking stack here, so this one becomes a new helper, the scheduling bit where you can tell the stack, please schedule transmission on this interface. The queue is to actually store the packets. We cover it, that's a new map type. And then over here, we do a new, a new um, program hook. And that, was the, uh, that was the first attempt, the uh, diagram with the performance bits uh, I showed before, that was actually queuing this. In terms of code, it comes really simple. This is a terrible queuing program. It just does FIFO queuing, um, but so it also it just enqueues into this um, PIFO map type, which you specify the range as the map extra field, and then you just redirect map into the PIFO. Here we always do uh, priority zero, so it's basically um, a FIFO in terms of behavior. And then if the redirect works, we will call this schedule I phase, which will kick off the um, TX soft IQ, and we will get a DQ program Transmit it over here, which would pull the packet back out of the PIFO and just return that. So this works. Problem. We don't do new program types anymore, as we heard uh, yesterday morning. And uh, Alexi suggested that we can do it without doing uh, any of these hooks. And uh, much as I hate to admit it, he was right. So back to the drawing board. We want a callback. Do we have something in BPF already that can do callbacks? Yes, we actually do. We have BPF timers. So how about we try using those? We keep the new map type. We, we have a helper that, just, that is just the um, sent this packet helper, and then we do uh, a timer callback to do this bit over in the uh, soft IQ. So that means that the code starts looking like this. Um, we in the HTTP program on Rx here, we look up the timer, arm it if it's not already, this is a one-time thing. And then we do the redirect map as we did before, but instead of calling the helper to schedule, we just start the timer with a timeout of zero, which is a way to sort of abuse the timer API to just get an, a callback as soon as we can. And then other, over here, we have the timer callback, which is a function defined in the same HTTP program. It's no longer a new program type, it's just a function in HTTP. And this will get the, um, the BPF timer. We can, re we can reference the map, and then we just do a loop here, so all the batching that the stack was doing for us before, 
um, we just do in HTTP, and this BPF packet sent is then an interface to just call the NDO HTTP XMIT function like uh, the stack was doing before with the batching um, so that we call flush when we're done, and that will actually flush the packets into the code. And like this, this helper is now four lines of code because it's just re reusing all the bits of the dev map. And then we uh, we keep track, and if we if we've done a batch and we want to come back, we do a, a queuing thing as well. So this this um, callback is because BPF timers are using the HR timer um, APIs. This would be called in a different soft IQ, which is the timer soft IQ. So it's um, sort of similar to what we want. Um, it's just not the TX IQ. I'll come back to that as well. So, one problem with this is that uh, compared to what we had before, we're now suddenly at 140 nanoseconds um, from the callback. So, this is due to the overhead of the HR timer. We're sort of abusing the timer mechanism a little bit by saying we want an immediate callback. We do want to do the timer thing with actual timeouts if we want to shape out, like if you want to pace out packets, you want actual um, timeouts, but if we just want to send packets as fast as we can, we need this immediate callback. And because timers, the HR timer uh, code takes a couple of locks, and, and that's that's a bit of overhead in, in sort of scheduling your timer. This adds up to quite a bit. Um, so I think the um, the approach of using the callback thing has seems promising. I do actually agree. Um, that it's a better API, we can all the all the batching can be decided by the BPF program instead of having the stack impose a particular way of doing it. So how do we do how do we deal with this overhead? There's also the risk of doing so much work in the HR timer soft IAQ. I'm a little worried about blocking other timer work. So um, there was some discussion on the list about a generic callback feature, um, which might be a way around it. We can also have uh, a bit of a hybrid approach where we still expose a helper to BPF to schedule a callback in the uh, in the TX soft IQ, but instead of a new program type, it will just be another way of executing the uh, timer callbacks. Um, so if anyone has any uh, thoughts on what would be a good way of dealing with this, or in general, please let me know. The another thing we have to solve that um, that I'm not quite sure how to do is that we need pushback from the driver. So we need to know, we don't want the driver to just drop packets on the floor if it can't keep up. So what the uh, pro new program type hook was doing was um, to use the same mechanism and then the driver will tell, uh, will, will come back and say, I couldn't transmit all the packets. And then the stack can just keep the packets queued on this small bulking queue and try again the next time it's called. But for BPF, um, we can't really return the programs immediately to the um, to the BPF program. That the BPF program really needs to decide. Okay, I could I tried transmitting eight packets. I can only send four. What am I going to do with the other four? Um, and I'd I'd rather not add another hook in the driver to sort of get this information ahead of time. But um, and and. The reason we can't just do the same thing we're doing in the stack is that if we do that, then we have to teach the verifier to ensure that the BPF program will either release or requeue all the packets that couldn't be transmitted. And this seems non-trivial. So any ideas for um, how to do that would be welcome as well. But uh, other than that, that is uh, basically it. So this is sort of another diagram to summarize what is uh, what is the proposal here for how to do this? With this, we will have the uh, XDP program starting a timer, still doing the redirect thing into a map, get stored in the uh, in the Python map, and the timer callback will then do um, the same thing, still in the context of the XDP program, but in a different software IQ, and the batching is done by BPF, and that still sends it out to the driver. So, um, yeah, thoughts, comments? This is also a PhD project, by the way. I have a PhD student working on um, implementing different queuing algorithms to show that this can be done in this uh, API. And many thanks to uh, Jesper and Katsukaya and Anna and Pierre who are uh, advisors on this. So I have a question about the timer part. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, the you queue a packet on an empty P5 
PIFO. So why should you start a timer? You, you should send, you could send the packet right away without the timer over it. Yeah, so um, this was a, like, you mean this bit. Again, instead of queuing it and scheduling the time, I could just send the packet. I mean, yes, that, yeah. that's because this is a bit of a contrived example to just show the overhead of uh, transmitting. So actually this, um, what, what this gets you apart from a lot of overhead is that you get a bigger buffer. So you can buffer, if, depending on how you size the map, you can, if, you, if you can't keep up, you can, um, you get a buffer of a, however many packets you size the map for. So if you have a bursty thing, um, um, I have second, so this is not a real queuing algorithm, obviously. My second question is about um, BQL or XOF state. So QDIS normally doesn't attempt to send a packet to the driver if the driver already say yes. uh, XOF, right? So yes, that was uh, that's this bit. How do basically we want to be able to do something like BQL? Mm -hmm. um, and one way of doing that is to have a hook in the driver, but then we need to implement that in the driver. BPF could also do the same logic, but we're not hooking into the packets that come from the stack. So what, what I was doing um, in the initial implementation is <clears throat> sort of reacting to the fact that the driver says, I can't uh, transmit any more packets, and then I just back off. But having something like B, being able to do something like BQL is definitely a goal. Also, I want to comment on your slide number six because you you say that um, when you would do the unqueue, then we fire the soft interrupt takes soft interrupt, but we don't. It's uh, a queue disk. When we do the unqueue, then we do just do the dequeue right after that. We don't rely on the soft interrupt by default. So if you queue a packet right now on QDIS, there is no soft interrupt triggered unless um, the watchdog needs to be set up. Right. OK. Yeah. So have you looked at, and I think I know the answer to this from past discussions, what kind of changes would be needed to allow XTP frames to go through the existing queue disk. So that way, the SKBs and the XTP frames, you don't have to have separate paths and separate handling, but instead, you're going through the same queue disk mechanism. And you know, like, kind of like the ton driver, there's a flag at the, the lowest bit that says, I'm an XTP frame or I'm a, an SKB. And then somehow figure out how to allow the same infrastructure to exist for both. Yeah. But Curisks tend to rely on details of the HKB, right? Right, that's what I mean by how much, how much work is needed to get this code, the NQ and DQ and scheduling aspects to handle both. Is it uh, just beyond the realm of possibility or could something be done to kind of carve it out? I it avoids the need, it, it allows both paths to, to interface yep. with the driver in a nicer way. You don't have to reinvent a lot of the infrastructure that you just already have. That, yeah. that's so the, so the, the reason I, I, I went with this approach was that my um, thought was that the answer to that is a lot, <laughs> and like more than that's what's feasible. I'm, I'm not sure it's possible. We, I think we use the CP field in the SKP, right, to store the length and the different information. So that's okay. how to get around the SKP. And Part of a potential path to do that would be to finish the list head conversion for SKB. Sorry? If you finish the list head conversion of SKB, get rid of that next and previous point and replace it with a true list head, then the structure is generic enough that we could place that at the beginning of X, the XDP buffer or something like that. Then we have this generic object we can push around either through scheduler or through paths. Yeah, that would, that would imply basically making the whole forwarding stack agnostic to whether or not it's a legitimate. That would be the, like the most ideal situation. Yeah. Uh, slightly related to what David and Jesper were saying. It's very dumb, but have you considered instead uh, 
for example, introducing a XDP different return code that will redirect the frame, translating it to an SKB. That's sort of what CPU map does. That will redirect to a different CPU, and then on that CPU, you will build an FKB, and that will go into the stack. And it's also through QDisk. Yeah, OK. So you mean redirect it to an egress interface and, and build an FKB at the last minute and queue it on the queue disk. Yes. But, but then, then we lose all the performance, right? Uh, uh, we lose some, some performance. Uh, I did something like that many, many years ago with something that resembled vaguely XDP and on very small size hardware, the loss was not so tragic. It yeah. was okay. very simple and it uh, fits uh, the normal traffic, like normal traffic will be shaped like the XDP traffic or partial XDP traffic. So, yeah. yeah but like if, if you look at, for example, the difference between generic and um, and driver uh, XDP, that also shows that performance grows really much out the window as soon as you're allocating FKBs. Like if you had something where you can build a bare bones F FKB without allocating any, any new pages or anything, that might change, but that's... But, but it's, it's just to save, like, implementing a new transmit, right? So, so you can use this thing. So the speed up, we could have uh, allocating the SKB, just not uh, in initializing the cache lines, and then making sure we only have to touch, like, that we know in the transmit path of the normal drivers, we only touch these things of the SKB, so we only need to initialize those, if we can do that. So we only need the first cache line in the SKB, then we might actually have to speed. Yeah. I have a question slightly unrelated, but you mentioned BQL. Do you have any information or experience running BQL or multi-Q devices and experience to tell us whether it's still relevant? Whether BQL is relevant. Is it? Sorry. We have multi-Q devices, right? BQL kind of counts as per queue. So I don't know how relevant it is. Well, so Depends on the hardware, but BQL helps a lot in general from like keeping the hardware from queuing up too many frames. No, but that's a good question because if you have a lot of receive queue than BQ, uh, transmit queue, then BQL is less effective. Mm -hmm. But I guess if you are using XDP, that's maybe because you are using less queues, like one, two queues, and there, there BQL is relevant. Yeah, so I, I, I had a, a bonus slide actually about CPU steering, which also is like receive queue steering that it's sort of like transmit queues and CPUs and everything. Um, and any, any synchronization you do between queues or between 